All right. <clears throat> Greetings again, everybody. Welcome to our weekly Bible study. It is great to have everybody with us again. And tonight we are going to... Well, we're going to begin what was supposed to be a short Bible study that had its genesis in uh, the recent drawing of my attention to a couple of names. <clears throat> and the, the first name is Tobiah, which is the name of a Christian fellow I met recently at church. <clears throat> and the second name is Tamar, who, who uh, that was the name of my first pastor's daughter, Pastor Jerry Graham at Grace Gospel Church, Grace Gospel Fellowship, Grace Gospel Church, I think, in Buffalo, New York, or around 1975. That was his daughter's name. Um, when these names were brought to my attention recently, um, my initial reaction to hearing the name Tobiah was, I thought, Tobiah? Tobiah, isn't that the guy who harassed Nehemiah? When, when Israel returned in the Bible to rebuild the temple, isn't that the guy who gave him a hard time? And, and I wondered, I wonder why anyone would name their kid after him. And then with Tamar, Tamar, I, I learned that that was the full name of a business associate of mine recently. And from what I recall, I thought, isn't, isn't that, isn't, isn't she, did she commit some sort of sin or she was associated with some really embarrassing episode in the Bible? <clears throat> and I wondered, like, why would someone name their kid after Tamar? So anyway, I decided to look up those names and see if my recollections were accurate. So I've learned one thing since um, starting this Bible study that one should always, when recalling something in the Bible that you've either heard about or heard someone teach on, or maybe you, you read it superficially before, it's wise to study out the whole matter. And, and, so, and I was also curious to see if these men who named their children after these two, maybe they knew something I didn't. Because um, one thing I've, another thing I've learned since I started this Bible study is that I don't know the Bible all that well. And there are some things that I've heard about all my life that turned out to either be not true or partially true or that I misunderstood or, well, even misrepresented and even misapplied. <clears throat> and when it comes to saying or thinking something about the Bible, one is wise to study the matter out. Study it out before you form an opinion and study it out especially before you speak on a subject. So this study is what I've learned so far about Tobiah and Tamar. And, and so the, the title of the study, by the way, is Two Tobias and Two Tamars. And so you can already tell by the title of the study, Two Tobias and Two Tamars, that I've already learned that there were two of them in the Bible, which I hadn't realized before. Um... And so from the get-go, I knew I had a lot to learn. <clears throat> so let's start with the story that I'll refer to going forward as the story of the first Tobiah. And to learn the story of the first Tobiah, we're going to start in Nehemiah chapter 7. So if you have your, if you have your Bible with you, turn to Nehemiah chapter 7, right? Uh, it, uh, how does it go? Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, right? In the Bible, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther. So find Nehemiah in between Esther and Ezra. And we'll start tonight in uh, Nehemiah chapter 7. But first we'll pray, Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for this opportunity that you give us to freely study and to freely share your word with others. We ask that you would be a blessing on us and that this study would be a blessing to others. We give all the glory to you in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> All right, so Nehemiah chapter 7, we'll start in verse 5. <clears throat> Nehemiah 7, beginning in verse 5. Nehemiah writes, And my God put it into mine heart to gather together the nobles and the rulers and the people, that they might be reckoned by genealogy. <clears throat> 
And I found a register of the genealogy of them which came up at the first, and found written therein, <clears throat> These are the children of the province that went up out of the captivity of those that had been carried away, whom Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had carried away, and came again to Jerusalem and to Judah, every one unto his city. And then uh, in, in Nehemiah chapter 7, then Nehemiah goes on and he lists the names, and then we'll pick it up in Nehemiah 761 <clears throat> at the end of the long list. Nehemiah 7, starting in verse 61. And these were they which went up also from Telmalah and Telharesha, Cherub, Adon, and Immer. But they could not show their father's house nor their seed, whether they were of Israel. The children of Deliah, the children of Tobiah, the children of Nakoda, 642. That's from the list quoted by Nehemiah of the families that went up out of captivity back to Jerusalem. Now turn to Ezra chapter 2. If you're in Nehemiah, you're very close to Ezra. Ezra comes just before Nehemiah in the canon of Scripture. And we will go to Ezra chapter 2. <clears throat> and where the scribe Ezra records for us, Ezra 2, starting in verse 1. Now these are the children of the province that went up out of the captivity of those which had been carried away, whom Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had carried away unto Babylon, and came again unto Jerusalem and Judah, every one unto his city. And then similarly, Ezra then lists all the names, and we'll pick it up again in Ezra chapter 2, verse 6, I'm sorry, verse 59. So go to Ezra 2.59, we'll pick it up there. Ezra records, And these were they which came up from Telmelah, Telharsa, Cherub, Adon, and Immer, but they could not show their father's house and their seed, whether they were of Israel. The children of Deliah, the children of Tobiah, the children of Nakoda, 652. <clears throat> so the two groups here that include the children of Tobiah are listed between the sons of Solomon and the children of the priests, and they could not prove they were of Israel. But we can tell, since they're on the list, that their claim was to be of Israel. And obviously their desire was to be of Israel because they came out of Babylon to go to Jerusalem with the returning Jews. And so I discovered that the first occurrence of the name Tobiah in the Scripture, it's not the Tobiah I had first thought of, the one that appeared alongside Sanballat to harass Nehemiah in the rebuilding of Jerusalem, but instead it was in, in regards to the children of a man named Tobiah who claimed to be a Jew, um, and uh, it, it turns out that Tobiah was appeared in, a, in a, a couple of obscure lists of names in the books of Nehemiah and Ezra. And this Tobiah is not associated with the harassment against God's people. This Tobiah is associated with a story of faith and an example of how, with God, faith supersedes the merely physical because even though the children of Tobiah could, well, even if they could never prove they were Jewish by blood, of course, we know that they would be allowed to proselyte and join the, the house of Israel, um, as would any Gentile back then who believed. We know that even known Gentiles could convert and join the family of Israel, uh, we see proof of that in Esther chapter 8. If you have your Bible with you and you want to see the proof that you didn't have to be born a Jew to become a Jew, you could become a Jew by faith. Well, I suppose you could become a Jew uh, for business reasons or family reasons. So a lot of people join a religion or a church for a lot of other reasons other than faith. But to leave the comforts of Babylon and go back to a broken down city or to go to a broken down city to be a part of a rebuilding effort indicates to me that the children of Tobiah were returning to Jerusalem by faith, whether they were Jews or not. And in Esther chapter 8, verse 17, this is after Esther saves the Jews 
and she destroys their enemies. We read in Esther 8, 17, And many of the people of the land became Jews, for the fear of the Jews fell upon them. And so that's how we know that any Gentile could proselyte and join the house of Israel. Now, between the two lists I just read in, in Nehemiah and Ezra, you might have noticed at first glance what might appear to be a numerical discrepancy. Now, a skeptic will point to something like this and he'll assert, well, there you go, there's another error in the Bible. And then they'll typically move on and they'll, they'll move your attention to, to some other supposed discrepancy and then maybe even one more. And then after doing that, they'll pronounce that the Bible is obviously unreliable and anyone who claims it's, wor it's the Word of God is just an ignorant, superstitious, probably trying to control you. And then they continue in their sin and rebellion, and they encourage others to do so as well, especially children. And for this they are condemned already, according to John chapter 3, verse 18. He who believeth not is condemned already. <clears throat> so there's a numerical discrepancy. So, uh, but, uh, but someone who, who wants to know the truth and is seeking God does not assume that a numerical discrepancy is an error in the Bible. But instead, someone who actually wants to know the truth studies the matter out. Study it out. We're told in 2 Timothy 2.15 and 16, to study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. So the supposed numerical discrepancy between the two lists of Ezra and Nehemiah, in fact, can be attributed to the fact that Nehemiah consulted a register of those who came up at the first, 642, whereas the later record of Ezra included the number counted at the time he recorded the people present in Jerusalem, 652. So there were more people later than there were at the first. We know that the returning exiles departed in more than one group because Nehemiah specifically reports that the register he consulted was of those who came up at the first, implying that others followed afterward. And also others were born. And, and, and by the way, <clears throat> this is also another, another piece of evidence that Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther were placed in the canon of Scripture in reverse chronological order, which that's an interesting Bible study in and of itself. Um, for more on that, you can consult our previous study on divorce or <clears throat> search Ezra, Nehemiah, Bob Enyart, E-N-Y-A-R-T. Ezra, Nehemiah, Bob Enyart. Search that online and pick up either one of Bob's Bible studies, the one on Nehemiah and the other on Ezra and Haggai, Haggai if you want to know more about that. And we'll touch a little on that later. So the first Tobiah in the Bible turns out is a picture of faith in Israel. That faith, by the way, rewarded with an inheritance in the land. That's the first Tobiah that I was unaware of. And maybe you were too, and now we're aware. And now let's go on to the second Tobiah <clears throat> in the Bible, the one, we, 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 the one I thought about. Turn to Nehemiah chapter 2. So Nehemiah chapter 2, this is written when Nehemiah got back to the area of Jerusalem to rebuild after the Babylonian captivity. And in Nehemiah chapter 2, starting in verse 10, he writes, Then I came to the governors beyond the river and gave them the king's letters. Now the king had sent captains of the army and horsemen with me. When Sanballat, the Horonite, and Tobiah, the servant, the Ammonite, heard of it, it grieved them exceedingly that there was come a man to seek the welfare of the children of Israel. So I came to Jerusalem and was there three days. That's Nehemiah 2.10. And, and then Nehemiah toured the ruins of Jerusalem in secret at night, and, and, and he kind of got the lay of the land. And then he told the Jews there 
that he was come with permission of the king to rebuild the city. And so we'll pick up the story again, starting in verse 19, Nehemiah 2, verse 19. When Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the servant, the Ammonite, and Geshem the Arabian heard it, they laughed us to scorn and despised us and said, What is this thing that ye do? Will ye rebel against the king? Then answered I them and said unto them, The God of heaven will prosper us. Therefore we, his servants, will arise and build. But ye have no portion, nor right, nor memorial in Jerusalem. So this reply of Nehemiah to the, to the second Tobiah is in contrast to the first Tobiah. The first Tobiah's children were given an inheritance in the land. This Tobiah, Nehemiah, says you'll have none of it. And now we pick up the story in Nehemiah chapter 4. And we'll pick it up in verse 3 when, when Sanballat, the governor, goes out to make a speech regarding the rebuilding of Jerusalem um, that Nehemiah had begun. He went out before the inhabitants of Samaria and the surrounding land. And these would have been the people that were imported from Babylon uh, and other pagans and a mixed multitude along with some of the Jews who had been left there in the land while the Jews were in captivity. And this governor, maybe now former governor, Sambalot, he makes a speech against the rebuilding. And we read that during that speech in Nehemiah 4.3, we read, Now Tobiah the Ammonite was by him. And he said, even that which they build, if a fox go up, he shall even break down their stone wall. And so there Tobiah demonstrates his faithfulness to Sanballat by mocking the Jews alongside him in a very public speech. And now we'll pick it up in Nehemiah 4, chapter, uh, chapter 4, verse 7. Move up to verse 7. Nehemiah 4, 7. But it came to pass that when Sanballat and Tobiah and the Arabians and the Ammonites and the Ashdodites heard that the walls of Jerusalem were made up and the breaches began to be stopped, then they were very wroth and conspired all of them together to come and fight against Jerusalem and to hinder it. And so by this time in the story, the reader might ask, Tobiah is merely a servant of Sanballat. Why is he even being mentioned by name? in this recounting of a military alliance made between leaders. And, and by the way, these leaders are just referred to as the Arabians and the Ammonites and the Ashdodites. But Tobiah, the servant, the Ammonite, he's mentioned by name. <clears throat> well, we'll see that Tobiah will figure far more prominently in the story than any of these others mentioned here, and that's why he's mentioned by name. Now let's pick it up in Nehemiah 4, <clears throat> verse 14. <clears throat> um, and this is after um, this is after the rebuilding of the wall had continued, and the pagans had made a league to attack the city. And Nehemiah writes in Nehemiah 4:14, and I looked and rose up and said unto the nobles, and to the rulers, and to the rest of the people, Be not ye afraid of them. Remember the Lord, which is great and terrible, and fight for your brethren, your sons and your daughters, your wives and your houses. That's uh, Nehemiah 4.14. Nehemiah, I noticed here, does not assume that the Lord will fight for them. <clears throat> and I wonder why not. Because when the children entered the land for the first time, God had told them he would fight for them and drive out their enemies. So I wonder, why didn't Nehemiah, why doesn't he pray to God and ask him to fight for them? Um, in fact, turn to Joshua chapter 1. <clears throat> Joshua chapter 1 recounts when Israel was being prepared to enter in the land for the first time. And in Joshua chapter 1, starting in verse 5, God tells Joshua, There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. And then in verse 8, 
God tells Joshua, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. That was back then with Joshua. <clears throat> but now, upon their return here with Nehemiah, what are God's people doing to receive his blessing? Have any of them even read from the Bible yet? Well, not that I've seen. And so let's see how they fare here returning into the land by their own strength. <clears throat> we'll go back to Nehemiah chapter 4. <clears throat> and we'll pick the story back up in, in Nehemiah 4, starting in verse 15. Nehemiah 4, 15. And it came to pass when our enemies heard that it was known unto us, and God had brought their counsel to naught, that we returned all of us to the wall, every one unto his work. And it came to pass from that time forth that the half of my servants wrought in the work, and the other half of them held both the spears, the shields, and the bows, and the habergeons. And the rulers were behind all the house of Judah. They which build it on the wall, and they which bear burdens with those that laid it, every one with his hand wrought in the work, and with the other hand held his weapon. For the builders, every one had his sword girded by his side, and so builded. And he that sounded the trumpet was by me. The, the, he who sounded the trumpet would have been the one to, to shout the warning, to give the warning sign of battle, the call to battle. And he was right there by Nehemiah's side. <clears throat> so it appears to me that Nehemiah's failure to seek God's protection... And his failure to bring the Bible to meditate on day and night, that cost him at least 50% of his productivity in the building. Because with one hand they built, with the other they held their sword. Half the people built, the other half had to stand guard against their enemies. And so there was that cost, but it was even more costly in that the nation could not receive God's full blessing because without meditation in the scriptures, they were simply not inclined to ask for it. And they should have known from their own history that if they asked God for it, he would give it to them. He had promised them that if they would turn from their wicked ways and ask him, that he would send rain and he would send food and he would, and he would defeat their enemies. There's a unique promise made to the nation of Israel. But they didn't have their Bible, so they were unaware. <clears throat> then in Nehemiah chapter 5, he recounts the difficulties with feeding everyone and financial disputes arising among the children of Israel. And we read in Nehemiah 5, starting in verse 6, Nehemiah 5, 6, he writes, And I was very angry when I heard their cry in these words. Then I consulted with myself. And I rebuked the nobles and the rulers and said unto them, You exact usury, every one of his brother. And I set a great assembly against them. And so Nehemiah is writing about the same people who God fed in the wilderness. And Nehemiah doesn't ask God for food, and he doesn't call God against those who are doing wrong against their brethren loaning the money at ridiculous interest rates. Um, Nehemiah doesn't call God against them, but instead he calls an assembly of the people against them. And then at the end of chapter 5 in verse 19, Nehemiah writes, Think upon me, my God, for good, according to all that I have done for this people. And so... Correct me if I'm wrong. That seems like the wrong focus Nehemiah has there. Think upon me for good, for all that I have done. He hasn't asked God to, for help. So now we'll go to Nehemiah chapter 6, and we'll pick it up in verse 1. We read, 
Now it came to pass when Sanballat and Tobiah and Geshem the Arabian and the, and the rest of our enemies heard that I had builded the wall and there was no breach left therein, though at that time I had not, up, I had not set up the doors upon the gates, that Sanballat and Geshem sent unto me. Um, Tobiah is mentioned by name here and for the first time he's not specifically singled out as the servant of Sanballat. This section describes an accusation against Nehemiah that Sanballat tried to deliver four times and it was refused by Nehemiah. And this accusation made in writing by Sanballat is that Nehemiah is setting himself up as a king to, re to rebel against the, the reigning king in Persia. And we read in Nehemiah 6 verse 5, Then sent Sanballat his servant unto me in like manner the fifth time, with an open letter in his hand, wherein was written, It is reported among the heathen, and Gashmu saith it, that thou and the Jews think to rebel. And, 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 and now here Tobiah is not mentioned by name, but only a servant of Sanballat. And then after denying the accusation, Nehemiah writes of his prayer to God in verse 9. In verse 9, Nehemiah writes, Now therefore, O God, strengthen my hands. That's what he writes. But, ne but Nehemiah was not following the admonition to Joshua to meditate on God's word daily. Instead, he was asking God to strengthen his hands. But there's no record of God responding. Um, no record of God responding positively. And without meditation on the scripture, God would have been limited in what he could do for Nehemiah and the people. And by the way, this section is further evidence. Well, this lack of, of them having a Bible at this point in the story with all this building going on, this is further evidence that Nehemiah entered the land before Ezra because it was Ezra that brought the Bible back to Jerusalem. And, and, and so according to the record, the returning Jews did not intuitively think that they should bring the Bible first thing. They didn't bring the Bible with them at the first when they came up. They were returning primarily in their own strength and by their own wits. And in chapter 6, in Nehemiah 6, picking it up in verse 10, we read, Afterward, I came unto the house of Shemaiah, the son of Deliah, the son of Mehetabiel, who was shut up. And interestingly, this Deliah, Mentioned here is one of the fathers mentioned along with the first Tobiah as one of the Jews who could not prove their lineage among Israel when he came down from Babylon. And Nehemiah is meeting with his son Shemaiah, who tries to get Nehemiah to enter into the remains of the temple. And Nehemiah reports that this Shemaiah was hired by the second Tobiah, the bad Tobiah, the servant of Sanballat, in order to trick him. So the accusation, you remember, was that Nehemiah wanted to set himself up as a king. And then according to Nehemiah 6, verse 7, he also accused, Thou hast also appointed prophets to preach of thee at Jerusalem, saying there is a king in Judah. That was the accusation. So the wicked second Tobiah made the accusation, brought the accusation, delivered it from Sambalot, then hired Shemaiah to convince Nehemiah to schedule a meeting with him in the temple. Because if Nehemiah held a meeting in the temple, the accusation by Sambalot that he had declared himself king and was appointing prophets to preach of him could then be corroborated by testimony that he was in the temple. So Sambalot, Tobiah, and Shemaiah, they were setting Nehemiah up. And Nehemiah was not only to be threatened externally by Sanballat and Tobiah, like with all this scheming. We read at the end of, of chapter 6 in verse 17, Nehemiah chapter 6 in verse 17, we read, Moreover, in those days, the nobles of Judah sent many letters unto Tobiah, and the letters of Tobiah came unto them. 
For there were many in Judah sworn unto him. You see, Tobiah was married to a Jew, a daughter of Shechaniah. And Tobiah's son was married to a Jew, a daughter of Meshulam. So Sanballat and Tobiah had gained entry into the house of Israel by way of marriage and were a part of the, they'd made themselves a part of the economic, socio-political hierarchy there. And so they were further able to undermine Nehemiah by luring him into a compromising position right there in the temple itself. And, and this brings us to an interesting point about the temple, and it gives us some indication of the chronology of Esther, Nehemiah, then Ezra. Because if, I've, if it's true that as I've stated before, the books were placed into the canon of Scripture in reverse order, with Esther first, then the rebuilding of the wall under Nehemiah, and then after that, the rebuilding of the temple under Ezra. Well, then how is it Sambalot is, is luring Nehemiah into the temple? Doesn't this mean the temple was already built? Well, for the answer to that, we'll go to Haggai, <clears throat> the prophet Haggai. That's going to be a little harder to find. It's toward the end of the Old Testament. He's a minor prophet. But Haggai records in Haggai chapter 1, starting in verse 1, we read in Haggai 1, starting in verse 1, In the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, in the first day of the month, came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet unto Zerubbabel, the son of Sheltiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Joshua, the high priest, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, this people say the time is not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Then came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet, saying, Is it time for you, O ye, to dwell in your sealed houses, and this house is, lies waste? So the Lord gives us a time stamp here, the second year of Darius, king of Persia, and God is upset with the people in Jerusalem that they dwell in sealed houses. By the way, sealed means it has a ceiling, which means it's finished, right? So he's upset that they're dwelling in sealed houses, but the temple lies in ruin. So when were the walls and the temple rebuilt and in what order? Well, let's go back to Ezra chapter 1, verse 1. Ezra chapter 1, verse 1, where Ezra reports, he's going to give us a time stamp here. Ezra reports in Ezra 1, starting in 1. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of, Jer by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom, and put it also in writing, saying, Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord God of heaven, hath given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he hath charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. And, and, and if you remember, this was prophesied by Isaiah. You don't have to turn there, but I'll read it from Isaiah chapter 44. Um, this is where God prophesied of Cyrus by name a hundred years or more before he was born. And this was shown to Cyrus, and he was quite impressed. Isaiah 44, 28, that saith of Cyrus, he is my shepherd, he shall perform all my pleasure, even saying to Jerusalem, thou shalt be built, and to the temple thy, thy foundation shall be laid. That's Isaiah's prophecy of Cyrus. And notice the Isaiah prophecy, again given over 100 years before Cyrus's birth, is for Cyrus to command both the city and the temple to be rebuilt. Now, Ezra, of course, he highlights the command to build the temple as this, the rebuilding of the temple was the focus of Ezra's mission. But Ezra clearly indicates by the time stamp that the, the rebuilding project spanned the lives of both Cyrus and his son Darius. And in Ezra chapter 4, verse 5, if you were in Ezra 1, just go up to Ezra chapter 4, verse 5. <clears throat> Ezra reports that in Ezra 4, 5, 
Then the people of the land weakened the hands of the people of Judah and troubled them in the building and hired counselors against them to frustrate their purpose all the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, even until the reign of Darius, king of Persia. And so the scripture indicates that Cyrus commanded the city and the temple to be rebuilt. That began under Cyrus with Zerubbabel and Yeshua and Nehemiah with the walls and the people's houses. And the construction concluded under Darius and Ezra alongside Nehemiah with the restoration of the temple. Um, and, and for more evidence that Esther marries Cyrus and then they had a son, Darius, who became the king, who saw the completion of the first rebuilding of the city and then the temple. For more evidence on that, you can refer to our previous study on divorce. We cover that more in detail. Now add to that the passage from Haggai, where God rebuked the Jews for, for finishing their houses while the temple lie in ruin. And there's strong evidence that the true chronology is Esther, then Nehemiah, then Ezra, even though the canon order is reversed for some reason. The canon order is reversed so that we will focus on specifics of these stories because there's something to this. There's lessons here that we should pay attention to. <clears throat> um, and so while the temple lied in ruin, um, it may have had some accessible room or rooms, or it could be that Shemaiah and Tobiah wanted Nehemiah to be seen holding a meeting in the temple after some of Ezra's restoration. Because rem remember, Ezra came along, Nehemiah was there. Nehemiah went back for a while. It looks like he went back to Babylon for 12 or 13 years and then, and then returned. So there's some overlap. And so the temple may have been partially restored. And they wanted to lure Nehemiah there in order to confirm their accusations that he was plotting to make himself a king because most of the kings in the surrounding pagan nations, they spent a good bit of time in their pagan temples. Some of them even declared themselves to be gods. So it would have been in character of someone plotting to make himself king. And notice that even as Nehemiah and Ezra, this is something to, to take note of, really. Even as Nehemiah and Ezra wrote the historical chronicles of the rebuilding that ended up in the Bible... God never speaks with either of them directly or even through a prophet. Um, neither are either of them recorded as having sought out God for regular advice, for protection, for food, for rain, all the things that God had promised. There, it's never recorded that they seek him out for that. There are only Nehemiah's prayer before he went before the king in Persia and got his commission to, to return. And then there's Ezra, Ezra's prayer in Ezra chapter 9 regarding the divorces that were being requested by the people. That prayer, by the way, was never answered by God or a prophet. It was answered by a mob. <clears throat> but in the story of the return from the captivity, God speaks through his prophets Haggai and Zechariah. And they speak of Zerubbabel and Yeshua, also spelled Joshua. Zerubbabel is spoken of as the leader, and Yeshua is spoken of as the high priest over the rebuilding effort. And so it's as if there's, there's some disconnect between God and the two men who record the history of the rebuilding that ends up in the Bible in, in reverse order. <clears throat> And, and so now go to Nehemiah chapter 9. Nehemiah chapter 9. We'll pick up the story after the Levites recount the history of Israel in the hearing of all the people. This is just after they finally start reading the Bible, by the way. Ezra had returned with the Bible. <clears throat> and the Levites go through all their history, and we pick it up in Nehemiah 9.38. <clears throat> Nehemiah chapter 9, starting in verse 38. And because of all this, the history that they just read, because of all this, we make a sure covenant and write it, and our princes, Levites, and priests seal unto it. 
So all the people made a covenant with God and they sealed it. And this is similar to the oath the children of Israel made the first time they prepared to enter the land. Back in Exodus chapter 19, you might remember that when Moses read all of the law to the children of Israel and as in Exodus chapter 19, picking it up in, in verse 8, And all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And Moses returned the word of the people unto the Lord. <clears throat> and then back to Nehemiah, we pick it up in chapter 10, verse 29. In Nehemiah 10, 29, they, the people, they entered into a curse and into an oath to walk in God's law, which was given by Moses, the servant of God, and to observe and do all the commandments of the Lord our Lord and his judgments and his statutes. <clears throat> and so these two oaths from Exodus and here in Nehemiah are indicative of the fact that Israel, by their own choosing, at least on a national scale, which is how God dealt with Israel, they were required to keep the law at their own request, at their own promise. They're, they swore an oath to keep the law. And this would prove impossible, of course. And later... When we study Paul's epistles, we'll better understand the disconnect from righteousness that comes by the law. Speaking of a disconnect. Now, let's go back to Nehemiah, and we'll pick up the story in chapter 13. <clears throat> so they've sworn the oath. And we pick it up in Nehemiah 13, starting in verse 4. Nehemiah 13, 4. Eliashib the priest, having the oversight of the chamber of the house of our God, was allied unto Tobiah, the second Tobiah, the bad Tobiah. Eliashib the priest, who had the oversight of the chamber of the house of our God, was allied unto Tobiah, and he had prepared for him a great chamber, where aforetime they laid the meat offerings, the frankincense and the vessels and the tithes of the corn and the new wine and the oil and the offerings of the priests. So this would have been a room in the, in the ruins of the temple or in the partially restored temple. And so before the temple was even fully restored for God, one of the priests had rented out a room to Tobiah in the temple. Um, Tobiah, by the way, being a pagan in league with an enemy of Israel, the, the priest is renting a room to him in the temple. <clears throat> and so this second Tobiah, the second Tobiah is emblematic of the lack of faith expressed by the leaders and the people as they return to Jerusalem. At this time, God accepted the faith of believers in Israel. Of course, God has always accepted faith. But in Israel, God accepted their faith only in accordance with the covenant that they had sworn to in Exodus 19. And now they've sworn to this further covenant that their leaders sealed, swearing again to the first covenant. God required of Israel the sign of obedience from them as well. He accepted their faith, but he demanded a sign, the sign of obedience to the law. And in this story, we see many signs of disobedience so far and, and very few signs of faith. There's a lot of talk of faith. There's a lot of swearing of oaths. There's a lot of gathering and lifting their hands and worshiping God. But there are few indications of genuine faith. <clears throat> and so this return and rebuilding is doomed to fall short. At least it's doomed to fall short in restoring true national belief and worship in Jerusalem. 
And it's obvious from the story as it unfolds later in the Gospels that the Jews who returned and rebuilt the city and the temple preferred worldly alliances to the likes of Tobiah, the servant of Sanballat, Tobiah the Ammonite, the servant of Sanballat. They preferred alliances with him to faith in God. And this helps us understand how they could have missed their Messiah. Despite understanding the prophecies of the scriptures about the timing of his coming and all the miracles he did, they missed him. Well, at, at, at the very least, they missed him. Some of them plotted to kill him. And, and this helps us understand that story. And, and interestingly, the good Tobiah is mentioned once in Ezra, in the list we read, and then the name appears 13 times in Nehemiah. And 12 times, it's the bad Tobiah. In fact, the 12th time is Nehemiah throwing him out of the room that the priest was renting to him. Um, and of course, the good Tobiah is mentioned once in the list we mentioned earlier in Nehemiah. <clears throat> the second Tobiah, the bad Tobiah, is referred to one time for each tribe of Israel, one time for each of the 12 tribes in the book of Nehemiah, as if to symbolize their faithlessness as a nation at that time. So this second uh, Tobiah is the servant of Sanballat, who he had been the pagan ruler of Jerusalem during the captivity. And unlike the first Tobiah, who was given an inheritance in Israel by faith, according to the law. This Tobiah, the bad Tobiah, is forbidden an inheritance in Israel initially because he served a pagan ruler, and then he's thrown out of the inheritance he was trying to purchase through the seduction of both the daughters and the priests of Israel. And so both Tobiahs together are a picture of God's relationship with Israel. God rewards Israel's faith by the law with an inheritance in the land. And God cuts off from the land those who serve other gods. And, and there's also an application for us today, believers today, who we live in the age of grace, it's called salvation by grace through faith in the blood of Jesus Christ. So what's the application for us? Just like the children of the first Tobiah, who by nature could not inherit the good things of God, we by nature are the children of wrath. And by our own works, we cannot earn a place among the children of God. But just as Ezra and Nehemiah included the children of the first Tobiah in the register of the children of Israel, God will maintain our names in the book of life because Jesus Christ is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him, and He is faithful to keep His promise of salvation today to everyone who believes. And so that's the first half of what was going to be a short study. That's the two Tobias. And next time we get together, Lord willing, we will study out the two Tamars and discover some wonderful, new, interesting uh, facts and applications. And I look forward to that. Um, until then, may the grace of God go with you. And may the peace of Jesus Christ be upon you. Let's pray, Lord. Thank you for the books of Nehemiah and Ezra and your word, Lord, that, that it, it, it's all connected and it's, it's just amazing and so obviously supernatural. We're just thankful that you've given it to us and that we have the freedom to study and to share it with others. We ask that you would help us to share faith in the blood of your cross with the lost world, and that you would bless us as we go forward. In Jesus' name, amen.